Throughout our first couple episodes, we've talked a lot about Christian localism, inspired by passages like Luke 16.10, that those who are faithful with little will be trusted with much, we're calling for the kind of obedience that really trusts God in day-to-day life with all that we do, particularly in community. But some of you may be wondering, how practical is this? Or does localism stay local? We really hope this episode answers those questions for you as we honor a man whose passion for localism quite literally changed the world, Arthur Guinness. Many have come to know and love the Irish Stout, which is about as identifiable with Ireland as Coca-Cola is with America, but have no idea that the Guinness Beer Company's foundations are built upon a rich Christian tradition. Most have no idea that the Guinness family may in fact be one of the most influential families in Western civilization's history. Most have no idea that dozens of lords, earls, politicians, clergymen, missionaries, doctors, and lawyers grace its lineage and continue to bless Ireland and the world today. Most have no idea that Arthur Guinness is one of the only Protestants to be honored in memorial in a Catholic church. Take that, Lutheran Calvin. This is all to say that the history of the Guinness family is more than worth exploring and admiring. Our prayer is that after this episode, you will feel inspired and encouraged that every time you pull a pint of Guinness, you drink in the blessings of Christ's kingdom and further its expansion. This, in the final analysis, is the whole point of knowing your doctrines and knowing your grains. The continued good account of our business calls for much thankfulness to Almighty God, while we humbly ask for the infinitely higher blessings of His grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Surely, it becomes me to speak of the Lord's patience and long-suffering towards one so utterly sinful and evil as I, and to pray that I might be enabled through grace to live every hour under the teaching of the Holy Spirit, patiently abiding His time for calling me to that place of everlasting rest the purchase of the precious blood of the Lamb of God for saved sinners. Now, Seth. Yes, Cole. Which church historian or theologian uttered those beautiful words? If I were to take a wild guess, I would say Arthur Guinness. I wanted you, as any you know, reform folk would do, say John Calvin or the Puritans. <laughs> no, you're you're almost right. It was Arthur Guinness the second. Oh, which. I hope that raises an eyebrow for a few of you guys. As again, as the intro said, we are about to dive into my my new hobby, as Seth can attest. I've been a nerd for the Guinness history in the His last two weeks. His new hobby is being a nerd. Yes, uh, <laughs> specifically of Guinness beer. So Seth, can you tell the folks how, how much I've been begging you to do this episode? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There, as you can see by all the merch and the outfits and everything. Yeah, <laughs> this one I am so excited. And uh, goodness, where do where do we even begin? Yeah, yeah. So Cole showed up, and uh, on all his way, he was like, "Hey, I I Amazon Prime something to your house," and uh, that showed up before Cole did. <laughs> and uh, yes, and so he started reading it almost immediately and didn't put it down until he finished it. Yes, and uh, and which is amazing because he like read half the book to me out loud anyway after he'd read it the first time. So. <laughs> and you're going to hear it again. Yeah. So for you folks who aren't watching uh, the, the, you know, this, this vi- like through video and you're listening on po- podcast, shame on you. Watch the video. No, we appreciate it. But <laughs> Seth is referring to this book that's laid out in front of us right now that is The Search for God and Guinness by Stephen Mansfield. You're going to hear me, uh, you know, rave about this book here in a second. Please go read it, go read it, go read it. It's a page turner. It's one of the best pieces of Christian literature I've ever read, which is crazy considering, you know, a lot of other great books out there. And everything that you read to me, it actually was really interesting and uh, stuff that you don't hear about. And uh, I was like, wow, that's actually incredible. Yeah. And uh, we're going to definitely unpack that. But I will say, aside from this book, what prompted me to even get the book was a wonderful trip with my beautiful bride to the Green Isles, to Ireland this past Christmas. Oh, the Emerald Isle. Yes. (laughs) Thank you for that. Uh, your your outfit was screaming it, um, and and it's it's I can't my, the words won't do it justice. You literally can't go to almost any block in the entire city of Dublin, which has a city which has a population over over a million people. You can't go anywhere without seeing the influence of the Guinness family. 
You can't say the same about New York. You can't say the same about Chicago or San Francisco. No, when you go to New York and Chicago, when you talk about families, you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> really bad families. Yeah, or, exactly. Or, organized you're crime. Part of the family. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. So uh, I really hope that you guys enjoy this one as much as I'm about to nerd out and enjoy it. But you know, maybe this will just be my selfish perk. But. Before we get started and do this beer review, I will give a couple of disclaimers. One, for you Guinness gurus out there, this is not, as you can see, the traditional stout. This is the no. Guinness Foreign Extra Stout, mm -hmm. uh, which means a couple things. One, I'll explain the history of it, why we went with this one today. Two, it will not have the typical aesthetically pleasing pour. I apologize for you nerds out there. Other people are I like, know you're just are... waiting there for yeah. like, oh, I can't wait for that, that pour. Yeah, yeah. Come on, stop talking, Cole. Where's the pour? <laughs> exactly. So I just want to throw that out there. But before we got into the review, I wanted to read some fast facts on the uh, on the brewing company. Um, that Now, granted, Mansfield wrote this book in 2009. So just imagine how these numbers have inflated since. Um, but these were at the time statistics that set Guinness apart as quite literally the most um, successful beer company in human history. So as of 2009, more than 10 million glasses of Guinness were consumed each day worldwide, which was 2 billion pints a year. Now, that number alone, 2 billion pints. There are 8 billion people on this planet. <laughs> and at the time, there was like maybe 7.5 billion. So Two billion pints a year. What Gracious. are you talking about? <laughs> that's oh. a very gratifying pour. Well, you yeah, you didn't do it right, that, but that's oh, okay. okay. This will be fine. mine. This that's will be mine. I'll demonstrate. You can with demonstrate my... the actual. I'm sorry. Pour. I can only say that now because I'm a you know I'm a okay, privileged right. nerd. But just Here, wait for look it. at It'll my set. basic American pour, everybody. Yes, yes I will. As do. you listen to <laughs> all of the, the wonderful facts. Yeah, so I'll, I'll demonstrate the correct pour here in a second. But in 1759, Arthur Guinness founded the Guinness Brewery Company in Dublin by signing a lease for the property at St. James Gate, which gave him the rights to the property for 9,000 years. He literally, uh, we'll talk about how this was the most shrewd business move in, in human history, but for 9,000 years, that property is going to belong to that family outright. Now, they didn't have the terms like we do today, but that's the most post-mill thinking you could ever, <laughs> you could ever. He had that much confidence in his product and in the, the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ to at least a property for 9,000 years. Arthur Guinness founded the first Sunday schools in Ireland and fought against dueling, which so, I, you know, that's the one thing I have against him. He I, I think that'd be still cool if we had around that to, had that around today. Wasn't but. Louisiana like the last state to? We were the last state to do a lot of things that we probably should have to get rid of dueling. Yeah, but we also were like the last state to desegregate. So I don't know if we want to <laughs> hold them as the you know the pillar of no, old I'm Christendom. Just saying, but. you know, you got that. <laughs> That dueling thing in your blood somehow. Yeah, somehow. Uh, he chaired the board for uh, one of the first hospitals for the poor in Dublin. Um, let's see. Let's keep reading here. Uh, by, by the 1920s, they were one of the only companies in the world uh, that, had, that offered full medical and dental care, massage services, reading rooms, subsidized meals, company-funded pensions, uh, funeral expenses, educational benefits, sports facilities, free concerts, lectures, and entertainment, and a guaranteed two pints of Guinness a day. Sign me up right now, <laughs> please. Uh, and we can go on and on and on. Uh, the last thing I'll throw out because he's who I want to close on. Uh, Henry Grattan Guinness, the grandson of Arthur Guinness, uh, was a Christian leader of such prominence that even D.L. Uh, Moody and Charles Spurgeon of their own words said that he was a better preacher than both of them. There's some reform boy listening to this right now that almost just threw up when I said that, but they, their <laughs> words, not mine. All right. So hopefully that piques your interest. And now we're going to pull some of these pints, and but yeah. Speaking of piquing your interest, now I want to know just how to do how, the proper pour. Yes. Yes. So now granted, this is not your typical stout, so it's not going to have the same foam to cream ratio, but none, nonetheless, the art is in the 45 degree angle. And then what I like to call the eschatological aspect of this beer. Uh, so Guinness is an eschatological beer in as much as it literally takes time to even be ready to be consumed when you pour it. Now, these are also not perfect because they're not the right size for these glasses since they're the foreign stout. But typically at this point in time, you would start to see the all the colors of the liquid change as it prepares to be foamed on top. So you would fill it up about 80% and then you would top it off on top. 
but it's just not going to have the same effect because of, you know, the kind that we have chosen. So it's sorry okay. if that was a little right. disappointing, but so, it's it's a very different so. look at the <laughs> look at the difference between. Well, hold on. If I, you still can't have, see. I still have beer in, in oh, here. Oh, okay. So. Well, then top it off. Top it off. Yeah, but it's yeah for you folks who can't see right now. Um, yeah, the, our two beers are not the Look same. Look at right? my our mighty two, beer. It is not compared the same, to your folks. silly American. <laughs> oh my goodness! Look at so, the crown on that. Oh, we're gonna make some Irish folk very, very, very <laughs> upset. Um, but here we go. You ready? I'm excited. To the king. To the king. Oh, oh! <laughs> Look at the foam. <laughs> I hope you folks zoom in on this. <laughs> <laughs> it's all over his stash. Now that, that's art. That's that is delicious. art to my taste. Was. So this is a 7.5 Alk uh, by volume content compared mm -hmm. to the normal style, which is like 4.2. So there, you might be asking, why Why are they swinging heavy on the foreign extra stout? Well, here's some interesting history for the you. The answer is why not? Yeah, that's <laughs> also true. But uh, this right here, the foreign extra stout was a posthumous secret of Arthur Guinness. So uh, in 1801, the year before he died, he penned in his personal memoirs the idea for what he called a West India Pale Ale, right? The idea was to increase the amount of yeast being used so that uh, and hops so that it would be able to be carried on ship to India and to other you know, corners of the earth. Hmm. It wasn't discovered till years and years and years later. And they're like, oh, this is perfect. That's going to be the product we can take all around the world. And sure enough, here it is. Now they had other innovations that now you can get any kind of Guinness anywhere, anytime. Right. But this was groundbreaking for the entire industry, and I would say quite tasty. Yeah. So you want to give some comments on it? Um, it is dark. Mm. It is delicious. Mm -hmm. I mean, like Calvinism. <laughs> it is. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so it's very interesting that you say it's like the West India. Yep. Um, because it almost has. The uh, the same characteristics of an IPA, yeah, very similar. Just, just it's so close, but it's not. But yeah, because it's, it's about to be bitter, and then it's like, no, never mind. We love Jesus. It's yeah. sweet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's evangelical. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm definitely gonna finish this in like two more sips. It's so good. Yeah, I should probably just like go get the other two. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we perhaps. Goodness. Before we continue on with the legacy, the literally world-changing legacy of the Guinness family, we do have an interesting chaser conversation today that Seth wanted to right. drive. So let's uh, see. One of the things that uh, Cole's been chomping at the bit about is is beer science, mm -hmm. and uh, he and I are relative noobs to the idea yep. of beer science. But beer layman, yeah. yeah. If so, let's get into some of the rudiments. So, all right, Cole. Yep. What are the four ingredients that you'll find in basically any beer? I'm so tempted to give you like the Avatar Last Airbender, you know, <laughs> earth, wind, <laughs> fire, water. Yeah, anyway, so so for beer, you're going to have water, wheat or barley, hops, and yeast. That's right. And so you combine all those things together and you get yourself a beer. You get a miracle. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but and so we've talked about this from uh, from the very beginning is like alcohol being an eschatological drink. Mm. Like particularly on our second episode, we hit home like the idea of wine being eschatological in nature. Yep. Um, but yeah. um, in Romans chapter one, uh, Paul makes a statement when he's talking about uh, the uh, the judgment of God upon people. But he makes this statement as um, in. Romans 1, verse 20, it says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were dark were darkened. So, um, we call that general revelation. Mm -hmm. Like the idea that creation itself is a testament to the glory of God. Yeah. But general re revelation is not sufficient in and of itself to lead you to Christ Jesus. Yep. Um, and Shout, so yeah. you need special re revelation in order to do that. And so we have God's word that's handed down um, by the Holy Spirit. I mean, it was 
breathed out on on men by the Holy Spirit who wrote it down, and then it was it was preserved throughout the ages um, mm-hmm. by men and oftentimes by acts of God. That uh, so that we have the Word of God here in our hand that we can can hold fast to. And so why I bring that up is that um, there are things in nature itself that you can point to about like to teach lessons about who God is. Oh, I like where you're going with this. And so (laughs) when you're getting, when you're talking about, okay, so, you know, eschatological drink, that's really cool. You know, what does that mean? But then even like getting into the ingredients itself and, you know, like you could break all that down where, uh, so like, so one of the ingredients, what? Water. Yeah. So... I mean, oh you boy. did. Yeah, <laughs> you did this this whole write up for the Battle on the Bride about yep. you know Christ the the seafaring conqueror. No man has conquered the vast frontier which covers eighty percent of the world's surface. Well, that is, except one man, the God Man, Christ Jesus. And uh, and the the um, the typological view of water and usage of water uh, throughout the Bible and how extensive yeah. and exhaustible it's all over the place. It's preexistent. Yeah. And excuse me, uh, that it talks about how it's associated with the underworld, how it's associated with death, but also how it's associated with the peoples. Yep. And uh, you're also talking about uh, when you get to, to the malt, which is wheat or barley or things like that, you have, have the wheat among the tares and uh, uh, I like where you're going with this. <laughs> and uh, and and so hops, I got nothing for hops. Uh, but bitter Calvinism. That's what you need. That's what you need. Well, no, the take, truth that I, God is sovereign. Yeah, well, so, so I take that back. So for hops, I mean, what hops gives it uh, the bitterness, right? Yeah, yeah um, the bitterness of our sin. But it yeah. also prolongs the life as yeah. well. And so, like in Isaiah five, you have like woe to those who who call uh, good evil and evil good, good. who uh, yeah. who. Uh, call sweet bitter and bittersweet or, or oh, things like that. Man, you're just fired from the hip. Keep going, <laughs> so, bro. Hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally you have yeast, which, you know, a little bit of yeast oh, works its way through the whole, snap. The whole dough. This man's and preaching. so the kingdom of God is is like yeast that works its way through the, the yeah. whole dough. So wow. as you're, I mean, you, as you're talking, you could, you could give an entire... Um, Theological, not theological, but entire doctrine, no, yeah. uh, gospel presentation by with using beer. the idea of beer, where it's like, oh yeah, we're, we're wow. yeah, we, we have sin in our lives, but you know, God came, and uh, when we are buried with Christ in our baptism, mm. water, wow, <laughs> raised to new life, um, yeah, we are, we are the harvest of Christ. Oh, I he really- has sown those <laughs> seeds. And he is the the great harvester. I really thought you were going to say, we are the beer of Christ. (laughs) (laughs) We are the body and the beer of Christ. Hey, what, what, I what mean, is the uh, what is our motto, sir? Uh, Servisium pro Christos. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, strength for Christ, beer for Christ. Yeah. And so, just as the yeast works its way through, wow, uh, the fermentation process in beer to produce this glorious, very glorious. Uh, wow. the the yeast of the gospel and the blood of Christ is going to work its way through the entire world and and the kingdom of God is going to come in great glory. And dude, I tell you what, I didn't know when you told me, yeah, I'm gonna talk about like beer theology and its elements. I was like, I have no idea what this is about. To be. That was glorious. I mean, there, there's a lot folks can unpack and all that, but I'd say you're absolutely right. And it only further justifies again, like there are glorious things that can be accomplished with pulling a pint. I mean, I'll say this, some of the most important decisions ever made in human history were done so over beers. Mm -hmm. Luther frequently in taverns. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, The decision for to initiate the constitutional um, convention was at a tavern in Annapolis. So shout out to my college town. Uh, The decision to start the Marine Corps was at Tun Tavern, 1775. So a lot of really the good things. The Inklings, they, they yeah, at a tavern. Yeah, exactly. With Lewis, Tolkien, and yeah. a whole lot. A lot of good stuff happened with pulling a pint. And yep. the, the first miracle of Christ's ministry. Yep. Wine. Wine. Oh, Other than his man. incarnation, but yeah. Yeah. Well, Min- yeah you you yeah, did qualify yeah. ministry. Yeah, so. that, you know, that's true. It's fair. It's All fair. Right. Well, thank you. That was a, hey, that might've been, I think that was my favorite chaser conversation we've had. So. Well, praise God, because I had no idea what I was going to say until we started talking. <laughs> it was the spirit slash the, you know, the booze. <laughs> but she needs the words. Hey, speaking in tongues. <laughs> Something like that. Well, gracious. I think that segues perfectly into what we're talking about. Because we're talking about if, uh, if the gospel 
saturates the individual. Mm -hmm. it, it takes literally what is dead and makes it alive. It transforms the old to the new. Um, we then are left with the challenging question, because this happens all the time. There's, there's been thousands of books written on this, and so many seminars like, I'm a Christian, so what now? And I'm afraid that our antinomian or um, pietistic culture, so one extreme or the other, either, well, you know, now we can sin that grace would abound, which Paul rebukes in Romans 6. Right. We can do whatever we want because we're going to be forgiven. Or it's, let's just do a bunch of spiritual floaty things that don't actually really affect the physical world, right? So we fall in one extreme or the other. Yeah. Those are not the solution. And I think what we can learn from the Guinnesses today would be the solution for a proper methodology of the Christian life, aside from particular theological houses, which you know where we stand on those. But let me read you this. Can this you draw was some hints about what that is. Yeah, <laughs> maybe just a tad, like the name of the show or something. But <laughs> right. uh, let me let's let's begin this conversation because gracious, we got a lot I would like to cover in a short amount of time. Let's frame this conversation with a quote from Mansfield's also, intro. Also, if you don't mind, I'm just going to sit back and let Cole drive and and just go along the journey with you. Oh, gracious. <laughs> no, you're, you're condemning them to my nonsense, but here we go. So here's from Mansfield's intro. He says this, we are used to religion that is sometimes an escape from daily life and to faith as fixation on life in another world. What Arthur Guinness founded was a venture propelled by faith. Yes, but by a kind of faith that inspires men to, to make their work in this world an offering to God to understand craft and discipline, love and labor, and skills transferred from father to son as sacred things. It was a venture of faith that took the fruit of the earth and through study and, study and strain, made it of something of greater value. Indeed, much of the great 250 plus year history of Guinness beer is a story in which wealth is gained through faith inspired excellence and then used to serve others for the glory of God. This is what Arthur Guinness founded, and this is the legacy of Guinness beer that still symbolizes all of this to this day. I read that, and I was like, I'm ready to run through a wall. Like, <laughs> let's do it. Let's explore. And we forget about that because we live in such a secular uh, world uh, that, that the Protestant work ethic built the modern Western civilization. As, as we know it, as we've come to know it and take it for granted. Yeah, I was going to say the thing that jumped out is the the faith-inspired excellence mm -hmm. and, like, what does that mean? Yeah. And uh, and so, like, first couple episodes, we close, like, with whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. Like, mm -hmm. And that's that's the framework that we should all be working in is is to glorify God. Yep. And, and so how do you do that vocationally? Yeah. I mean, to frame it even further, Luther said this once. He said that uh, a Christian shoemaker is not such because he puts crosses on the heels of every boot, right? But because he does his work excellently. Mm -hmm. um, and we forget that. And I, I myself, I fall victim to not caring as much about the work that I'm doing because I'm aiming for quote unquote more spiritual things. When all the while God's saying, hey, bear fruit where you're, pr where you're planted, right? Um, so as we as we dive into the story of the Guinnesses, um, it's very important that we frame church history to that point with respect to alcohol. I'm actually, I say that, but I'm gonna get to that more at the end of the episode because I'd rather tell you more about the Guinnesses before we run out of time. Yeah. Uh, but what you do need to know on the onset is that contrary to popular belief, um, in the same way that today, right? If I expected to, all right, hey, where can I, go anywhere in the in the country, the United States, to get like cheap clothes and any groceries I can imagine, like pretty much instantly, I think Walmart, right? It's like, right, it's yeah. known as like the common venue by which I can acquire these products pretty much anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. What you were not told in Sunday school is that the church throughout the entire medieval era was the institution in which people regularly acquired alcohol. Church ales <laughs> were brewed at monasteries and cathedrals um, as the, the the joyful harvest unto parishes as we know it. That this is food for, th for thought for a guy who's uh, considering planting a church here. In the yes, next two year. guys that are <laughs> trying to plant churches. <laughs> cheers. Amen, cheers <laughs> to the king. So maybe you zealous folks out there in reformed and evangelical circles are thinking about what's our next ministry practice, start <laughs> brewing beer. But the reason I say that is because if we're going to understand the life of the life of Arthur Guinness, you need to know his grandfather brewed uh, for his community, his mother brewed for their household, and his father brewed for 
wait for it, an archbishop. <laughs> no kidding. One of the archbishops of the Church of Ireland, uh, Archbishop Price to be exact, he was the chief brewmaster. And so, as we will see throughout the continued history of the family, from father to son, Arthur Guinness's father taught him the ways of brewing beer. That all sounds wild, but I'm telling you, it's absolutely true. So <laughs> Arthur, being a zealous young man, there have been myths that have circulated that you know, one day he was walking around the streets of Dublin and he saw that there was a, uh, a severe alcoholism issue because the water was contaminated for the, for the masses and people were turning to hard liquor to, um, to, for, their, for their daily use and then became addicted, right? There is some truth to that, uh, but it wasn't this kind of charismatic epiphany that he had late in the night in a conversation with God. It actually was a process. Arthur um, left his household and knew that he had a trade, which I would say is a mighty trade. I, I would love to learn the trade of brewing these beers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he started initially uh, outside of the city of Dublin in a small village brewing for them. And after a while, and he mastered his craft. You gotta remember, this is before, like now, literally beer science is legitimate science. Like we have machines and researchers who they have this down to a T of exactly what they wanna make and how they wanna make it. Mm -hmm. Back then, it was far more of an art than we take for granted. There's, there's a lot of things like that. That's a side conversation of, there's so many things in modernity uh, that we take for granted because we're the Amazon Prime generation. We can get anything in two days or less, right? Uh, we just, I press a button, it has to happen. Exactly. Yeah, the, sh the shirt. We got we got these on Amazon. So, and the book on Amazon, goodness. Uh, <laughs> we are so mechanical, we expect, hey, I will press this button and I don't know how it happens, but an outcome will, will result, right? right? Whereas these brewmasters, literally by the twist of knobs, the temperature of a distiller, right? Had to just basically feel it out. Yeah. And so it was, this is why, uh, and Mansfield covers this in the, in the book, ancient peoples literally saw brewing as a gift from the gods, which then the Christian worldview came in and said, no, no, it's only one God. And he has said that he's given it to gladden our hearts. So there's only one God, ma'am. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great movie quote because I'm thinking about another and then smashes it. Yeah, yeah. This we're talking about Marvel movies for you, uh, ignorant folks. We love you. Anyway, so that being said, uh, the the reason why I framed it that way is Arthur Guinness grew up in a Christian home in which he had an, a, a very very high view of the church's role in society and the state, and at the same time he inherited the evangelical um, obligation that the world must know Christ and I must do what I need to do in order to aid in that end, right? So he gets the idea, I need to move to Dublin. I need to open a brew house there. Now, granted, he finds this little shack at what's called St. James Gate, which used to be St. James Church, but it was level. Very mm. unfortunate. But it's odd. Neither Mansfield nor any other historian really knows how he did it, but he convinced the, the property owners, hey, I will pay you 100 pounds now and 45 pounds a month for 9,000 years. Put that in perspective. When my wife and I went to Dublin to go to the Guinness storehouse, our tickets were more than 45 pounds. They're yeah. making 45 pounds probably every second. They're probably making more than that every oh, yeah. second. Yeah. So, <laughs> by far. so, he, so he, he pulls this off, but at the same time, he just knew that this was his passion and he had to do something with it to glorify God. Now here comes John Wesley. All right, so John Wesley comes to Ireland to preach. Now, context, John Wesley is a disciple of George Whitfield. George Whitfield is the father of the Great Awakening in Europe and North America. Was, were they disciples? They, they were friends, so. Wesley learned directly under Whitfield. Now, they had theological differences, which oh, played yeah. out in yeah, time. Tremendous. For those of you who don't know, Wesley was the father of uh, the Methodist Church, of Methodism, as yeah, we know it. Definitely we an Arminian. Yes, uh, but he, in private correspondence, said that he was within, quote, a hair's breadth of Calvinism. <laughs> right. It was just limited atonement they didn't like. But yeah. conversation with another George time. Whitefield, like, almost Very Calvinistic, died yes. Because he was Arminian. And then... <laughs> yes. And then when he, uh, when he like, realized, oh, the doctrines of grace, like, this is where it's... This is the truth of the gospel. Then Whitefield, Calvinist, Wesley, not so much. But interesting thing. Now, Whitfield had previously preached in Ireland. You got to remember, Guinness is growing up in a time that's pre-America. America's not a thing yet. The colonies are there, but they're not independent. The he's colonies. Growing, he's going at a time, he's, he's, he's living in a time in which Ireland is a cesspool for violence between Protestants, Catholics, and the English, right? Whitfield comes to preach as this world-known Anglican preacher. Mm -hmm. He is beaten almost to death, no kidding, in the streets of Ireland. 
And all the Protestants said, I'm not going there, except Wesley. Wesley shows up and starts to try to instigate a revival. Doesn't necessarily happen. He leaves discouraged. But what he didn't know is he inspired, inspired none other than Arthur Guinness, who did tremendous things for the gospel through, wait for it, beer. So over time— That's like always the story, though. It's yeah. like, you know, there's one preacher who he doesn't instigate the revival— but he saves, like through his preaching, a man is saved who does, or who yep. who does a great work for God, yep. uh, or in the name of God, and yep. like that's that's the case with the the man who preached for like Billy Graham, and he mm-hmm. was saved, and yep. like he was the only one who who uh, accepted Christ or you know got saved that day. Anyway, go on. So yeah, I'm sorry. I know I'm driving and it's going yep. all over the place, but we're, we're going to get to all the 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 boom, 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 boom things here really quick because it, it really did take off the ground once he had developed that famous, beautiful stout. That's just oh, it's the best, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, interestingly enough, he wasn't that confident in it. He also <laughs> was brewing pale ales at the time, and he had a flour company, right? So those two other things didn't take off. But it was the stout that uh, that really took over because, like the myth indicates, people were struggling with alcoholism, and it was far easier to turn to a dark stout from hard liquor than it was to a blonde ale. And take off, it did. It was a huge success in the UK uh, and eventually into Europe. Uh, but at the same time, as this wealth came in, here's, here's what separates the Guinness family from some American uh, pioneers of industry that we think of like Rockefeller or Vanderbilt, he knew that he had a responsibility to his city and his country, uh, and most importantly, the kingdom of God to do good with the wealth he was given. So seeing what was going on in the UK with the development of Sunday schools, as our fun facts indicated, he jumpstarted the Sunday school movement in Ireland. Now, when you and I think Sunday school, yeah, I was we, about to say, yeah. please clarify because yes, yes. <laughs> because there are some like reform folk who just went, Hoo! yes, yes, yes. When I say Sunday school, I'm not talking about Veggie Tales, Bible stories, and coloring books. Right. I'm talking about what Sunday schools originally were, aside from the the practices in Methodism. They were to be essentially free spaces for the impoverished and less fortunate to receive a formal education, but specifically a Christian classical education. Yeah, so it was children like tutoring. Yeah, basically. yeah, no. It, so imagine it was like school yes, on Sunday. Yes, and uh, so instead of five days a week, right? It was one day a week. You, it was a, it was a hyper intensive. They would go in at ten, and from ten to twelve, we're learning. How to, how to read, how to write, arithmetic, logic, philosophy, you name it. They would go to the Lord's Day service. They would go home for an hour. They would come back and be catechized for four hours. <laughs> I love the disparity there between two hours of formal education, four hours of catechism, because that's what they needed. Right. And it changed the demographics of Dublin, not in a day, not in a year, but over time mm-hmm. to where Dublin, unlike the rest of the Republic, is predominantly... Protestant, though the rest of the Republic is Catholic, of course. Right. So, so a huge influence. So then what's really, really interesting, and we can go on and on and on, but again, I only have so much time. So here so you what have, I just learned from you is mm-hmm. catechize your kids. <laughs> Change a nation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or at least a metropolitan area. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then just as Practical he- Practical application point one. Yeah. Catechize your kids. Change the nation. Change the nation. (laughs) Practical point number two, father to son relationships are are key. I mean, we see this in the Trinity. Like that's how that's how essential that relationship is. Father to son, right? So what began after Arthur Guinness was what preceded him. In the same way that he had learned how to brew from his father, he taught to his sons. Now, remarkable, again, post-mill thinking, him and his wife had 21 children. Now, unfortunately, only 11 of those lived to adulthood. Um, but because of all the tragedy that they experienced and they saw in the impoverished city, they have since, even to this day, have been one of the leading funders and organizers of uh, even now the largest children's hospital in all of Europe. Hmm. Absolutely insane. Uh, but those 11 children went on to do remarkable things because he taught all of his sons how to run the business, how to brew. But most importantly, he taught them that the Lord Jesus Christ is king, all right? So what we see is the secession 
over and over again for fi- for the next five generations of father to son leadership. So from Arthur Guinness the first, we go to Arthur Guinness the second, who we quoted earlier, and as you could tell, was a firecracker for the gospel. Now this is insane because remember again, this is a hyper Catholic time, a hyper um, uh, violent time amongst the society there in Dublin and Ireland at large. Right. And right. Arthur Guinness goes in and he doubles the profits and the size of the company. But I would say most importantly, um, whereas we don't have a lot of verbatim quotes from Arthur Guinness the first on really anything, Arthur Guinness the second wrote a lot about what was going on with the family, but most specifically what was going on with the faith of the family. And it's beautiful. His quotes are so powerful. And then it played out in the fruit. So Arthur Guinness um, the second, interestingly enough, wasn't even supposed to be the one who inherited the company. It was supposed to be... Um, Arthur's first child, um, Hosea. Now, this is another trend you'll see happen in the history of the family. Why did Hosea turn down the inheritance of the family? It wasn't because of another vi- business venture. He tur- Because he-, he wanted to go into the ministry. Yes. Uh, how'd you know? Ding, ding, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. And believe it or not, that would happen several times in the history of the family. Um, so it's quite beautiful. Hosea, again, the oldest, the firstborn son, turns it down to go be a clergyman. And a clergyman, he did. He was uh, institutional for the development of the evangelical Protestant cause there in Dublin, again, at a very, very violent time. But nonetheless, the baton passes to Arthur Guinness. In the same way, Arthur Guinness's first uh, son, Arthur Guinness III, also turned down the inheritance, though for less noble means. He is actually just super irresponsible. (laughs) So then it turned over to Benjamin Lee Guinness, who tripled, again, the productivity of the city and what's really remarkable about the him- The city or the, the company? Uh, oh, excuse me, the, of, of the company, which oh, okay. in turn the city, and I say that because this, whereas Arthur Guinness II resisted involvement in politics, because he was like, hey, we're just, you know, we're doing our own thing. We're going to keep these spheres secret. Right. Benjamin Lee Guinness ended up being not only a member of parliament, of Irish parliament and British parliament, he was the first Guinness to be knighted. He is Sir Benjamin Lee Guinness, and he was a stud. He was one of the first advocates in the family to really, really pioneer the workers' benefits. So when we espouse those fun facts about what they looked like in 1920, a lot of those fruits came from the root of his work. Now, granted, what's remarkable, what has always set Guinness apart is they have always operated on a principle of we cannot expect um, investment from our people if we are not investing in our people. Mm-hmm. So they they have quite literally been the template for all the big companies we know, Facebook, Google, you name it, although I'd say they did it far better. Um, well, it sounds like it. Yeah, absolutely. So moving on, what was really instrumental, and this is, and this is another characteristic um, that you'll see, is, again, some of these firstborn sons uh, or other children, they would turn down you know, their responsibility to the companies. And that's fine because some of them pursued noble means. But uh, what ended up happening, even by this third generation, is you really had three branches of the family emerge. You had the brewers, the bankers, and the Christians. Well, they were all Christians, well, but the Christian leaders, yeah. the Christian leaders specifically. Right. So let's wind it back a little bit. And so Arthur Guinness's um, firstborn son, again, he goes into the ministry. His last, so his 10th child that that lived, right, was John Grattan Guinness, okay? So John Grattan was known as Captain John Grattan because he joined the military and he had a long career and he was successful in the military. But unfortunately, when he tried to join the family business, he was a complete failure. He was given basically two different uh, markets to run and they both did not do well under his, under his leadership. So he ended up uh, for the rest of his days pretty much being a, a farmer and kind of a uh, tending to his own interests, so to speak, though he did different things with and for the family over time. But here's where we have, again, We talked about practical point being catechize your kids, change the nation. Mm -hmm. Father-son relationship is essential. Extend that to the rest of just family child rearing and centering around the faith. A lot of people would look at John Grattan's life and say he didn't really do much for the company. And that's fair. But what happened next was crazy. His youngest son, Henry Grattan Guinness, was the one we mentioned earlier who was, you know, fancied by Charles Spurgeon. Henry Grattan would go on to be an absolute unit, (laughs) to to put it bluntly, for the kingdom of heaven. At 21 years old, 
George Whitfield, who we had mentioned previously, the father of the Great Awakening, mm -hmm. his church offered him a position to pastor at 21 with no formal education. He turned it down to go street preach in the Ulster region, where after being there for two weeks, within the next three years, 100,000 churches were born wow. in that region. At 21, no formal education. He then went on to continue to preach, continue to preach for the rest of his life. And interestingly enough, now, now granted, where we, would, where we would differ with him is he was actually on the forefront of dispensational thought. It was like instrumental to its development because he actually did predict a couple of things that came true. Kind of crazy. But <laughs> aside from that, we absolutely love him. Um, but we see the, that's where this third line, the Christian and missionary, the Christian leader and missionary line came from was, was his descendants. So Henry Grattan's uh, daughter married, no kidding, the famous missionary, J. Hudson Taylor, married his son. So the Guinnesses were one of the, one of the forthright uh, leaders of funding the Chinese inland mission that Hudson Taylor led, which gave us the underground Chinese church we have today, which everyone reveres as like the fastest growing church in the world. Mm -hmm. Let that sink in. This is all coming from beer. <laughs> this is all coming from God's use with beer. I know that we've just, I've just fire hydrant styled, giving you guys a ton of information, but this is all coming from one guy saying, even this silly thing that we call beer, I will use for the glory of God. And now we're talking about a family line, which has seen, no kidding, millions come well, to Christ. It's millions. Like, so what comes to mind is, you know, God uses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Yep. Basically. Yeah. And so, I mean, it, it's like our, our human pride to say, oh, well, this thing is just so small potatoes that, you know, what good is it? Like it, it can be of no higher use yep. than its intended purpose. Which then and the then, Lord goes, hey, this is my blood hey. poured out for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. <Yeah>. And, uh, <laughs> and so then, you know, then then you have Christians come along and who, who say, oh no, like all things are the glory of God. Like, so it's interesting that one of his descendants, Os Guinness. Mm, who is the great, 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 great grandson of Arthur, but he's from the, Gra the Henry Grattan line. He, he grew up in China. So yeah. he, like- his talks on calling have been pivotal for me personally because it's the first time that I'd ever heard anyone say that whatever you do, whether you are a farmer in the field uh, or if you're like making shoes or whatever it is that you're doing, do it to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Like the, the farmer in the field or the wife in the kitchen or whatever it is, like you are no less important yeah. than than like the minister in the pulpit. Yeah. And, and that was revolutionary thought in their day because of the, the Roman Catholic idea of like the, the hierarchy of the yeah. clergy being- Magisterium. Yeah. yeah. And so like that was, if you wanted to serve God, you had to be in that kind of a position. Yeah. You had to go into like the priesthood or become a monk and, and practice asceticism and things like that. Yeah. And then the Protestant thought comes along and says, no, 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 no. No, all things to the glory of God. And, and so that's why they call it the Protestant work ethic is because you apply yourself in all areas of life. And that was the first time I had heard anyone talk about it in such a way yeah. as he does. And Which makes sense now, right? You can yeah. see how it's literally in his blood to think that way. You no, know, it's because like sitting here, I was like, oh yeah, Os Guinness. But I told you about Os Guinness. But then I was yeah. just now, I was like, oh wait, <laughs> no, duh. He's yeah. a descendant. He's a and descendant. So, yes, it all so, makes sense. Uh, so all coming, and speaking about localism, you know, wait for it. He's a Virginia resident. Yes, he is. So Oz, please, 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 please. It would butter my biscuits. It would, <laughs> it would literally butter my egg roll if, uh, if for whatever did reason. Did you just throw in a Chinese reference? Yes, just, just yes, because. I did. He grew up in China. Do, do they butter China? So, yeah, anyway. I don't know. But if you ever wanted to be on the show to talk about literally anything, please. And uh, that would, I, I would get, get I'm smiling now. I'm, I'm <laughs> giddy about it. So anyway, uh, <laughs> moving on back on the farm. Um, no, you're absolutely right, brother. And the, the way I wanted to close out because we, we do need to pick up the pace. 
uh, on the legacy of those first five generations. We then had Edward Cecil Guinness, who again, continued to really pioneer into the fl- fl- uh, philanthropy. Um, the, the foreign stout's getting to the me. The foreign stout, that's yeah, 7.5. Stout is 7.5. <laughs> I want another one. Uh, <laughs> of the city and expanded the mark, not just the investment markets of the company. He, he, was, he was actually instrumental in getting the, um, the company uh, as a stock market entity which was huge. It, that did so much for them. Um, but in terms of what they would give to the city and uh, to the less fortunate, to the impoverished was huge. Now, with Edward Cecil to the fifth guy, which was Rupert Guinness, we see something else that was very, very, very important, which has been very important to the history of the family come into play. And that is, again, when you invest in your people, and I'm not just talking about employers, I'm talking when you invest in your children, when yeah. you invest in your neighbors, when you invest in your per, your fellow parishioners, uh, and invest that, invest in your spouse first. Yep, yep. Sorry, sorry. Spouse, foreign stout, foreign stout, getting to me. Just, yeah. Uh, the <laughs> the and when I say parishioners, Baptist, I just mean your other church folk. Uh, the <laughs> people eat the, chicken with. The, the, <laughs> uh, when you invest in people the best of people comes out. And so what you really start seeing by the time of Edward Cecil is other members of the company start playing a huge role in what they would do. So with Edward Cecil, you see the arrival of Dr. Lumsden, who over time would receive numerous awards for his tremendous work for public health. Um, He was a doctor, brought on scene to work on, uh, you know, Guinness employees. And you realized, oh, people are always sick. It must be traced to something. It turns out they all had horrible living conditions. Yeah. So he had this revolutionary vision of transforming, uh, transforming the living, the quality of life standards for employees and eventually the entire city. And that played out over decades that he wouldn't have anticipated for. And sure enough, uh, I myself can testify, the, can testify to the fact that, that that is still an ongoing project in Dublin, which the rest of the world is modeling. So it's still happening. So again, really? when you invest in people, the best comes out of him. We really see that with Rupert. He's really special though. I'll save uh, more on him in a second. But one of the guys that came about uh, with Rupert, I'm blanking on his name, but he, Rupert was able to convince Edward for the, now keep in mind, almost 200 years has passed by this point. That's how, right. that's how okay. much time could pass in generations. And they had never advertised. Huh. Think about it. You can't watch a YouTube video today. You can't listen to Spotify unless you're a premium member. You can't do anything today without seeing ads. Mm -hmm. They did not advertise. (laughs) It was all word of mouth, right? Utterly insane. And Rupert convinces Edward, uh, hey, we need to start advertising. And by the time Rupert received the reins of the company, he starts advertising. They brought in this guy, I'm blanking on his name, but not only were they tremendously successful with um, advertising, but the fruits of the kingdom, uh, you know, really bore themselves from these. So I felt really dumb. And I, when I felt really dumb, I told Seth, I never made the connection. This first marketing campaign, we're talking about the 1950s now, this first marketing company or marketing campaign, campaign. excuse me. Uh, they got this idea of, Hey, um, you know, what if with our drinks and with our six packs and all this stuff in our barrels, we just include random stuff for bars to hand out to people. And they get the idea of the quote, Guinness Book of World Records, which now we just know as Guinness World Records. I felt so stupid. I was like, how did I never make that connection? But they literally, on a whim, they did not expect it to succeed. And since then, it has been one of the best sellers year after year after year. Because like, I couldn't help but as an elementary school kid, go to the you know the the book fair and go grab the Guinness yeah. Book of Records for this year, right? It's a staple. It's like, oh it, man, who who did like this crazy thing? And yeah, and, and they it was, it they was wanted literally to, started just to to settle bar disputes. Yeah, honestly, and it was always focused on oddities because they yeah. thought they were fascinating. That same campaign, this is also wild. They dumped over two hundred thousand bottles of Guinness into the ocean with a like a, a message in a bottle because we all grew up on those tall tales, right? They <laughs> actually did it. And those bottles, and basically the message would say, hey, it's a great day to have a Guinness. Write to us when you found this bottle, right? <laughs> and not only did their sales go up, but people are still finding those <laughs> bottles today, which really? is insane. Yeah. So they, the advertising really, really took off for them. Lastly, again, that same guy, Rupert, before we wrap up on them and just talk about beer and church history. Uh, and I hope that this has all perked your interest. What you're saying is that the beer went into the water and went to the nations. Yes. <laughs> 
absolutely. Just like the sacrament of our Lord's Supper will, right? So the whole, all the nations are baptized with wine. Anyway, uh, so Rupert, this is really, now this is one of the things, like I said, this lineage includes lords, earls. What Rupert did, and, and I'm being dramatic because it deserves it. What Rupert did was unreal. Rupert, upon Edward Cecil's death, now Edward Cecil had like six kids, seven kids, a, a big number. Mm-hmm. And they all received, you know, a lump sum of inheritance. Rupert received from that and his uh, from his wedding gifts, five million pounds. Edward Cecil, or excuse me, Rupert decides to take that five million pounds and move into the slums of our, there is no government project housing. This is just the slums. Right. He moves in and uses the rest of the money to transform that area into a village for the, the locals and the workers of the Gators company. Lives there for seven years. And they endured, him and his wife endured uh, horrific heartache uh, from horrible sicknesses to miscarriages to you name it, to violence. They stayed there. And it was so profound in the market of the city that not only him, but his wife as well, both ended up being elected to parliament. And wow. it was the first time in Irish history that a, a married couple <laughs> was both <laughs> elected to parliament, right? Like that's unheard of. And what's also crazy is, so at the time, Guinness now has been, this is again, 1950s, sent all over the world, right? And, uh, but now folks are, are worried about conflict of interest, right? So there's, there's one, there's this iconic moment in uh, the parliament where, this parliament member is standing up, is going on a rant about how the Guinness company is overreaching. They've got their hands in government. They've got their hands in banking. They've got their hands on the markets. And uh, most importantly, they're affecting public health because the campaign slogan at the time was for the Guinness company was, quote, uh, Guinness is good for you. And he goes on this rant. He's going on and on and on and on. And Rupert, who to that point and after never gave a speech on the floor of parliament, gets up. And he says five words. And that's all he ever said on the floor of parliament. He said, Guinness is good for you. (laughs) Like a boss. And he leaves. So anyway, that's all to say that what happened with the Guinness family, you literally have the proliferation of dozens and dozens and dozens of not just ministers, clergymen, and missionaries, as glorious as that is, and praise be to God, hallelujah, praise hallelujah, right? You also have pioneers of industry that have forged some of the institutions that we take for granted even today, mm-hmm. all from hops, yeast, water, and, and wheat. Yeah, yeah, and barley. Sorry, I was like, I was like, what did I, what did I say? What did I not say? Wow. Let that sink in. We have about ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> before I could uh, get into church history on beer. Well, that was quite but, a wild ride. Yeah, I hope that that, uh, that really, you know, tickled your interest. I don't know, any, any, any thoughts on what we can learn from the Guinness family? Because I, I was so inspired reading this book. I was, I was entertained. And I, I tr- like the intro, I wasn't exaggerating. Like when, I, when, when we put it together of like, every time I drink a Guinness, I'm, I'm, I'm praising God like, wow. Whether people know it or not, this is extending Christ's kingdom, and it's right. delicious. I mean, it's glorious, but that's— <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the thought is, first off, like the long-term planning require— Well, so it's not even long-term planning. It's just it's kingdom planning, yeah. right? And yeah. It's, it's, it's creating something that you don't intend to die. And cultivate it in such a way that it just brings glory to God, and so, so that's gonna transform the way that you think about a thing. Yep. Because if you're just thinking about, oh, this is the best way for me to to make a buck right now, because like like tons of people will will make startups. Yeah. Like that's it's true. Like in the last twenty years or so, people have made a bundle by making startups that they offload to other bigger companies. Yep. So that they get crazy amounts of cash and then they go and they start another company and they have to do it again, again. do it again, do it again. Yeah. Yeah. So like the whole thing is like this, this cyclical thing where they're chasing after money rather than like chasing after a legacy. Yeah. And, And that's, that, that's inspiring because like you could, you could literally take something like I've, I've got friends who, who buff dents out of cars. Yeah. And they could make a family business out of that for generations. Yeah. And, 
and maybe it's not as big as Guinness, but no, I it's, mean, yeah, it's something yeah. like, yeah. So, um, but that's that is the the thinking that that's how Christ transforms our thinking. Yep, because we're aware of we're aware that we're not just living necessarily for for ourselves. Yeah. And amen to that, because how how meaningless, like this is one of the reasons why the secular worldview is hopeless, because it really is just you and you're going to die. That's the that's it. That's the end of story. But aside from the Christian hope and the resurrection, which is pivotal, we are the people of the resurrection. We will be in glorified bodies and we will dwell with our father for eternity. As, as glorious as that is, mm -hmm. we don't just live on in that way. Arthur Guinness, his image is being echoed through the generations even now, not just right. with the fruit of his hands, which we just both emptied our glasses on, yes. right? But if, if uh, man is the image of God, then man's own posterity is the image of him. And so long as the Guinness family continues to love God and serve people, they're going to be echoing the legacy of Arthur Guinness. It's just inescapable. It's inevitable. And the challenge is on all of us in our own households, what are we doing? It doesn't have to be as grandioso. It doesn't have to be this multi-billion dollar industry. Right. But how is it that we are thinking about discipling our great, great, great grandchildren? Mm -hmm. That changes everything. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that comes to mind is, is in Proverbs where it says that a righteous man uh, stores up an inheritance for his children's children. Mm -hmm. And first and foremost, you need to be storing up an inheritance of faith. I mean, you need to to make sure that that legacy of faith is not broken. Yeah. And so that's going to require like spending time with your your wife, spending time with your kids, um, uh, and and making sure that you are investing in them. Because uh, my wife and I, when we had premarital counseling, it was one of the the pieces of advice that always sticks with us is that um, your family is your first ministry. Yep. Absolutely. And I so, mean, yeah. We saw that with John Grattan Guinness, again, a guy who had failed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I forgot to mention, his first wife died when he was young. So you have this middle-aged guy who can't run any businesses, and he marries a widow. And no one really expects greatness out of that, but he loved his wife. He mm -hmm. loved his children. And above all of that, he loved Christ. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, his son goes on to be one of the most prominent evangelists that the church has ever seen. Right. So that's an inheritance that that never dies. Yep. And, and so I mean there not everyone is going to be Guinness. Not a, no. not I mean Arthur Guinness is Arthur Guinness uh, because God appointed him for that that time and place. Hallelujah. And there are people people who have come and gone and who are living and dying right now who are not going to have a name that's as great as the Guinness family. And uh and so so our aspiration isn't to be like Guinness. Our our aspiration is to be like Christ. Mm. And, wow. Yeah. And so that's going to inform how you live yeah. everyday life. And and it could be just being a faithful, faithful person in the smallest town of West Virginia or Louisiana. Hey, wait um, a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing disservice to West Virginia and comparing yeah. those two. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, like, yeah, like there no, are, no, I know what you're saying. I totally growing agree. up in yeah. like in situations that that are hopeless financially the outside. or yeah. or whatever, like. Um, and so there are often dreams of like, what can I do to get out of this town? Yeah. And and so like the one thing is to be faithful where you're at. Um, and if there's an opportunity, yeah, take it. But yeah. the, the other thing is like, the question is, okay, if I can't get out of this town, what can I do? What yeah. can I do to transform it? Yeah, that's a really powerful concept. And then what, yeah. what can I do so that... So that if I stay here and I raise my family here and I'm rooted here, then what can I begin to lay down? What principles can I begin to lay down within my family and within my church, and things like that, so that um, over the next 50, 100, 200 years, there's a, a drastic transformation. Like Wesley going and like no revival in, in Dublin. Ireland. And he's leaving discouraged. Yeah. And then bada bing, bada boom. Here you and I are in 2023 talking about a guy and his family that mm -hmm. have seen, again, millions of souls saved. And Wesley so. was preceded by Whitfield. Yep. And Whitfield was preceded by, you know, some 
other men who some guy yeah he's probably pretty cool yeah but he uh, probably drank too so you it's, know but was preceded by so and so was preceded by you know so and so was preceded by saint patrick yeah who yeah oh i'm so glad you said that because i've got about two minutes to talk about church history but keep going okay all right <laughs> But wrap it up, preacher. You're doing that thing. <laughs> <laughs> you got to talk for like 30 that's minutes. That's true. Straight. That's true. That's true. Um, but the point, the point is like, don't be discouraged if you're not in the place where you want to be right now. Cause, cause I think that, that one of the disservices that we have is that we place such an emphasis on the material result of what we would call post-millennial thinking or just like faithful Christian thinking. Like we see that and we we latch onto it because it's actually really cool when when you see that fruit come from yeah. it. But there there are people who've lived and died and were faithful Christians who who continued on the legacy of faith without having an abundance of yeah. material goods. Yeah. And and the inheritance that they stored up for their children's children is is an imperishable one that cannot be bought by gold or silver, but that was purchased by the the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. You're quoting um, Arthur Guinness the yeah. second. Well, I was quoting Peter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you're right though. You're absolutely right because there many of those saints, not only did they have no idea if if their toils were going to bear fruit, but they were probably like thinking the opposite, like, oh, well, that was kind of for squat. <laughs> yeah. But then lo and behold, their descendants go on. Because that's the thing. Today we live in a day that focuses on immediacy. Mm -hmm. If you don't see the fruit, uh, well, immediately, well then eh, something's wrong. And then two, we judge men based off net worth, immediate net worth. Right. How much does Jeff Bezos amount to right now or Elon Musk right now? Hey, I'll tell you this. Arthur Guinness, yeah, he made some money before he died. But literally what his sons would go on to do after him. Uh, and I'm not just talking about materially, but again, spiritually, mm -hmm. puts all those men to shame. Right. And how much more all the other saints of history who we don't even talk about, what they have, because again, as you were saying, you're going, to, going down the spiritual line, you know, who preceded who, who preceded who, who preceded who. And it's all the inheritance that's stored up for those right. um, whom, whom God is working all things for, Romans 8, 28. Yeah. Um, but we so, only have... Go ahead. You want to say anything? So yeah, let me, let me just put it in this perspective: is that that if you if you set your your mind on Christ, like don't set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. But that doesn't mean stop thinking about earthly things. And so yeah. by by having your mind transformed by Christ, and by emphasizing those things, those are the the Christian. Uh, not I don't want to say worldview, but the gospel is what is carried the the Guinness family along. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. and that has informed all of the actions and and everything else that they've done so that you do see like an abundance of material wealth. But if you were to if you were to take away the gospel and you were to take away the integrity that was informed by that. Yeah. It wouldn't then, have got off the ground. No. Yeah. So and yeah, there are you know wicked people, unrighteous people who do who do benefit, but, but here's the thing you have, you have people at judgment who will go through the fire and their works will be tested by fire. And so you have the people who have the billion dollar net worth. They have, no, if they don't have Christ, there is nothing that will last in yep. that fire. Yeah. It'll be cut down. And the people who, who have Christ and the things that they've done, are the result of, of a sanctified mind uh, with the, the idea of glory, you know, those things are going to last. Yep. They're not just going to get into heaven, you know, by, with oh, the smell of smoke. You, you tell me there's going to be Guinness in heaven. I'm so <laughs> grateful. Hallelujah. I'll, the preacher said it, so I'll believe it. But uh, anyway, so, so I, I guess I say all that stuff to keep things in perspective because we can get so monetarily minded that we would – the devil would use that to discourage us yeah. from being faithful Christians or to do stupid things. Yeah, when, or, or the opposite. We would just say, I don't need to worry about any of that. And then we proceed to be the most unproductive Christians in the history of the church. Right. Um, but so, all things are the glory of God. Yes, yes. And I'm glad you said that because we actually don't have time to mention anything in church history with respect to beer. But good thing we have a whole show for that. <laughs> um, the one. Oh, I thought you said we had 10 minutes until we could talk about church history. Oh, yeah, no, no. Oh, we're definitely, so we're definitely at like an hour time. now. But uh, you know, it's okay, it's okay. But what My I will say, we'll get to all that fun stuff. I mean, there's going to be a promo for this episode that'll introduce some of it. We'll explain later. Um, 
The last thing I wanted to say in here, though, was, in fact, one story that I can't help but tell because it's just crazy. So again, Mansfield is setting all this up about the Guinness family with just history of the church and beer. Um, and he tells a story that we did not hear in elementary school about the Puritans. Mm-hmm. And upon actually arriving at Massachusetts Bay, they're, you know, they're, they're struggling. Right. It, it, it's it's horrible conditions. Um, and they're trying to literally put a town together, right? People are are, are sick, people are hungry. And they have these men standing watch one day, right? And two natives approach. Now, remember, you're a white <laughs> European in the uh, you know 17th century, right? Early 17th century. You have never seen, honestly, very many people of color at all, but especially Native Americans with shaved heads and ponytails at the same time, mm-hmm. wearing nothing but loincloths, right? And as they approach, these these uh, these pilgrims are terrified, and yet. In clear English, one of the <laughs> one of the natives. This is a true story attested to from primary sources. This native calls out, "Hi, how are you?" And they are they're just they're what? He's speaking clear English with like no accent. And he goes, "They don't even answer yet." And he goes, "Do you have beer?" <laughs> now the 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 true context behind this the the Native American's name was Samoset. And he had his buddy Squanto there with him. Mm-hmm. Samoset had ridden slave ships uh, as a servant boy, cabin boy, for quite a bit of time and did a tour in England and got to have English beer. Yeah. So when we celebrate Thanksgiving every year, about the, you know, the pilgrims endured, I want you to remember that you, you must have beer at your table because <laughs> that was one of the olive branches extended between the pilgrims and the Native Americans was mm-hmm. the fine miracle nectar that we call beer they actually didn't have beer at the time that he asked they had strong water but yeah (laughs) no but they uh yeah no but eventually like beer was one of the pivotal movements of the civilization there they were like we need to be able to brew real beer because like it's they believed it was essential to their health which i would say you know maybe but that's (laughs) the point is in all this we've covered a ton of stuff today I hope you feel inspired. I hope you feel encouraged. I hope you're intrigued to study more of the Giddis family because I certainly didn't do it just here. Yeah. Get this book and others. Um, but at the end of the day, even something like our drinking, <laughs> what it is we're choosing to drink, who's making it, how is it made, um, it finds its roots in scripture. Mm-hmm. And God will get the glory despite the iniquities, despite our stupidity and selfishness and abuses. God will get the glory and I, for one, am more than comforted than uh, of that truth when I pull a pint of Guinness. So thank you guys for allowing me to go on my rant today, my soliloquy. I am uh, obsessed with Guinness to this point, and I hope that someone else will be after this. It doesn't well. show at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, Seth, I had fun today. I hope you did too. Yeah, it was great. And I'm glad that you read through that entire book in like 24 hours. And I <laughs> all these things out and... Uh, no, I'm excited, and uh, one of these days I might actually read through it. Um, Good, because I love the the things that you've told me that we there were things that we didn't even talk about here. We'll get but, to another episode. Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. So maybe one of these days we'll do like a uh, like uh, an after after show kind of yeah, episode. Yeah, that'd we'll be kind of cool. You know, members only kind of. Yeah, thing. take a lesson from the cross politics guys. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Shout out. You know, <laughs> before we do our closing, I will say this too. We haven't mentioned this in any episode, but we we've told ourselves that we sh- that we were going to. So here, I'll say it now. Local brewers. Oh yeah, yeah. If you would like for us, we've got four episodes at this point, right? Right. Yeah. We might have five people watching, fifty people. Who knows? We don't know yet, right? Yeah. Um, if you would like for us to review your beer, please. Mm-hmm send it in tell us how we can acquire it we would love to shout it out for you as well as any other local vendors of any kind we're big proponents of localism so please uh, reach out via the email or the social media platforms and we would love to discuss your products and shout them out to the Christian faithful around the world yep because after this you are going back to Florida so local looks a lot larger (laughs) than just Virginia (laughs) still in Dixie though oh wait a minute there's another episode there but Well, Cole, how goes the world? The world goes not well, but the kingdom comes. The kingdom comes. Oh, all right. I was worried I was going to mess it up. (laughs) Thank you, guys. Have a good one.